the origins of white supremacy and institutional racism in Minnesota. With who were some of those slave owners that you stumbled upon through this research? Well, the very first ones that I found were people who had come even before Minnesota was organized as a territory. Mm. And actually, they didn't come to Minnesota at all. There were people who were in Minnesota who had come from northern states. And they were the people who dealt in the fur trade. But the company that they worked for was actually a company based in St. Louis, Missouri. And the people who operated that company were slaveholders. So the people in Minnesota who were trading in fur, people who would be considered Minnesota's founding fathers, like Henry Sibley and Henry Rice, mm. John Prince, all those Minnesotans were paid by slaveholders in St. Louis for trading in fur. And so that started in the 1830s and 40s. And by the time you get to the 1850s, the American Fur Company that was operating in St. Louis is no longer operating in fur, but operating in real estate instead. And some of those same Minnesotans who were trading in fur started selling off some of the land that the St. Louis Company owned. Dred Scott was an enslaved foundational black American who unsuccessfully sued for his freedom in the United States. So in about about 1830, when Dred Scott was in bondage, and um, what was the military's role, kinda, and what companies, do, are we aware of any companies that were involved with, with his situation? Well, I'm not sure about, well, actually, the American Fur Company, one of the partners of that company was John Sanford, who's the Sanford of Dred Scott versus Sanford. Mm. But he didn't own Dred Scott the whole time. It's not until about, I think, the 1850s when John Sanford becomes Dred Scott's slaveholder. But as far as the, the slaves at Fort Stepney are concerned, they actually weren't supposed to be there, legally speaking, because there were two federal laws, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 and the Missouri Compromise of 1820, that said that all land that's in the area where the state of Minnesota is today is supposed to be for free states. It's free territory, and then later on it's supposed to be for free states. But in order for the U.S. Army to entice soldiers, and military officers especially, who were stationed in the South to come to Minnesota and be stationed at Fort Snelling, the U.S. Army said, even though slavery is illegal in this part of the country, if you want to bring a slave, you may, and we will even give you a stipend to care for that slave. And so that's what happened. There were quite a few military officers from Missouri who were stationed or who were reassigned to Fort Snelling. I think they had come from Jefferson Barracks in Missouri, and they went to Fort Snelling, and they were able to bring enslaved people with them. And Dred Scott was one of those people who went from Missouri to Minnesota, and eventually back to Missouri, which is where he first sued for his freedom. It was politically corrupt before it became criminally corrupt. 
And the reason was politically corrupt, because if you have political corruption where a politician can just change the chief of police, what happens is that pretty soon the police officers don't listen to the chief. Because the chief has no authority, no power to, to affect it. And in Minnesota, the police officers has a great deal of authority and a great deal of job stability. As you know, know that under Minnesota law, they are the only people that have a peace officer bill of rights. That's in law. There's the regular bill of rights everybody else has, but police officers have a bill of rights. What does that mean? It means that it's difficult to fire them. If you as a citizen make a complaint about a police officer, you cannot make that anonymous. Police officers have the right to know who it was specifically who made the complaint, what they're complaining about. That's in law. Okay? So, in 1932, a couple of things happened. It used to be before that time, the mayor would come in, whoever the mayor was, we had a two-year term back then, and that person would change the police chief. When the police chief changed, so did the other departmental heads. Your homicide, the vet tech, your detectives, your burglary. So it was a constant turnover. After a while, police officers, seeing that, said, hey, we're this dude. All you got to do is get into politics, get fired. Then we do what we want to do. That became so bad that the police officer didn't really respond to not only people that were working class or poor, didn't even respond to what the rich folks in town wanted. And at that time, St. Paul had a whole lot of millionaires. There's a street called Summit Avenue where the millionaires live. And they had a lot of authority. What changed it? Two of us changed that. There's a gang of people, a gang back then too, Bob Barker's gang came in and decided, we got rich folks here, let's go take one. And let's ransom them back. Schmidt Brewery, brewery not there anymore, as a brewery. People that owned it were the Bremers. They grabbed one of the Bremers. They held that individual for a while, and in 1932 dollars, his ransom was $200,000. That wasn't good enough for him. They went out and grabbed Bill Ham, Ham's Brewery. The other group, the group is very large this time. They grabbed him and they ransomed him back. The rich folks said, rich folks can't even walk down our, our city streets because our police department's not protecting us. What they did then was they got on the charter commission and they decided we gotta change the law. Two things happened. Once, they made police officers civil servants. And anybody that knows anybody that ever worked for our city, or state government. Civil service means that you just can't be fired without some process. You can't get rid of it. So they gave police officers a lot of authority to keep their jobs. The St. Paul Police Department is the oldest police department in the state of Minnesota. The Minneapolis Police Department is the biggest police department in the state of Minnesota. Both have engaged in institutional racism. Dr. Christopher Lehman discusses his book, Slavery's Reach and how slave owners invested financially in the foundations of the state of Minnesota. This is a Black Lives Matter Minnesota Film and Research Department production. So yeah, this is very interesting to under to know that even though so-called slavery wasn't happening here in Minnesota, 
that there were actual businesses here in Minnesota uh, as early as the 1830s who were using money that they earned from slavery to buy real estate right here in Minnesota. That's right. And after the Minnesotans received the money from the slaveholders, they used that money to develop communities, such as Henry Sibley developing the city of Mendota, mm. and Henry Rice developing quite a bit of the Twin Cities. And a lot of these people who were involved in the fur trade, that's how they became powerful in Minnesota, and so they used that power to become politically active. So Henry Rice was one of our first Congress people. Uh, Henry Sibley was actually the first governor of Minnesota when it became a free state, but he was actually still working for the slaveholders in St. Louis, selling off their land. So it, we have this weird um, conflict of interest where you have the governor of a free state working for slaveholders and still getting paid by slaveholders in, I think, between 1858 and 1860. What other businesses were here uh, in Minnesota that, that uh, come to mind? Mm -hmm. Well, the insurance company that we know as Travelers Insurance today was another company before. I think it was called the St. Paul Marine and Fire Insurance company or something like that but a man by the name of Thomas Winston who was a slaveholder from New Orleans was one of the first investors of that company another business that's also an academic institution is the University of Minnesota right and there was an enslaver from South Carolina who held somewhere between 700 and 800 people his name was William Aiken and it was actually at the request of Henry Rice, who was serving with Aiken in Congress, that Aiken come to Minnesota and see what he wanted to invest in. And when Aiken came to Minnesota, the U of M was actually shut down. It had been closed for two years after being open for three. Mm. But in 1856, Aiken decided that he would loan $15,000 to the university, and that amounts to about a quarter of a million dollars in today's money. Wow. But when you enslave 700 people and put them to work on your plantation, then you have that kind of money. Mm. And the following summer, Aiken cashed out or took out half his loan back. So that still left $8,000 that the university owed. And then the Civil War happened, and Aiken lived in a Confederate state and Minnesota didn't want to owe money to a Confederate because he would be considered the enemy for living in enemy land. So Minnesota passed a law called the Rebellion Act in 1862 that said that no resident of a Confederate state can come to Minnesota and sue in its courts. So if Aiken wanted to get his money back, now he can't. So. Wow. So the University of Minnesota never had to pay the money back to the slave holder that they got the money from. That's correct. And they never did. Um, was Aiken also a governor in his yes. state? Or? Okay. Yes, he was a governor of South Carolina as well as a congressman out of South Carolina. So Sylvanus Lowry was originally from Kentucky. Mm. He and his family went from Kentucky to Wisconsin in the 1830s because President Andrew Jackson had appointed Sylvanus's father to be the missionary for the Ho-Chunk Nation. And as the federal government kept pushing the Ho-Chunk further west, the Lowry family went with them until Lowry's father retired and went back to the south, but went to Tennessee to live. But by the time the father retired, Sylvanus was an adult, and he had started working for American Fur. In fact, he reported directly to Henry Rice. And when Rice quit in 1849, Lowry quit with him. But he earned enough money from the fur trade to invest in real estate of his own. And in 1855, he bought the northern third of St. Cloud, which is around where the St. Cloud Hospital is. And the following year, 
St. Cloud the city was incorporated and Sylvanus Lowry was the first mayor. And while he was mayor, he invited his father's colleagues in the ministry from Tennessee to come to St. Cloud and buy some land from him. And there were about a half dozen slaveholders who came to do that. And those six slaveholders paid, I think about $12,000 in one summer to Lowry for land. And again, that's a quarter of a million dollars. So Lowry was able to use that money from slaveholders to start St. Cloud's business community. He was able to get warehouses built for local business people to rent for their enterprises. And a few years later, in, I think, 1861, he started a newspaper that is still being published today. That's the St. Cloud Times. Right. Wow. So, and that paper was uh, called the Union, but it was pro-slavery. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And yep. So, and uh, that's still that's still around today, and that's called um, the the, the St. Cloud the St. Cloud Times. That's right. When you talk about uh, the book that slavery was part of some of the financial foundation here in Minnesota, and we're talking about some of these these people, uh, can you expand a little bit on that? Yes. Um, there were three ways in which people who lived in the South and who held slaves could come to Minnesota when slavery was illegal here. The first way was to either free all their enslaved people in the South or free them in Minnesota. And I have not found evidence of anyone who did that. The second way was for enslavers to find someone in the South to hold their slaves for them while they were living in Minnesota. and. I found evidence of people who did that. And then the third way was for enslavers to sell all the enslaved people in the South and then come to Minnesota without them. And I found instances of that happening. In fact, in chapter three of Slavery's Reach, I quote from a couple of advertisements in newspapers where people who ended up moving to Minnesota announced in their hometown newspapers in the South that they're going to hold auctions to sell all these people before they go. Wow. So, basically they would sell if you did sell all your slaves then you're still taking money from slavery from people who are in bondage and then you're coming to Minnesota and then you're buying land and you're buying businesses and creating generational wealth for uh, their children. That's right. And the Pace and the Spain families of Virginia were able to build up the town of Belle Plaine after having auctioned off their slaves. And the Garrick family of East Baton Rouge, Louisiana was able to build up the city of Shakopee after mm. having auctioned their slaves. And there are other examples. Um, I believe there's George Clitheroe of Alabama who bought quite a bit of land in Scott County as well. But what happens when you have Minnesotans who come with all this money from auctions is that they're using money from activity that split families from each other and split mothers from babies, split husbands from wives and so on. And no, it is essentially blood money that's yeah. been used to build up those particular communities in Minnesota. So I didn't know that. So Shakopee yes. was built off sl money from slavery. Yes, in large part. Mm -hmm. Wow, see, I didn't know that. And then what's another county or another city that, that you would say that is similar to that? Mm -hmm. You just said with a little bit about uh, St. Cloud. But. Right. Well, certainly St. Cloud, at least the, the northern third of St. Cloud. There's a neighborhood in St. Paul, the Payne Phelan neighborhood, right by Lake Phelan. And there were three people from Maryland. Two of them were slaveholders. 
Harwood Iglehart and William Sprig Hall. And they co-invested in the Payne's Valen neighborhood. And if you've ever noticed that neighborhood having streets that have names of Southern flowers, it's because they're from the South. And that's the name. Those are the names that they wanted to give to those streets, like Ivy, Magnolia, Hyacinth, Jessamine. And of course, there's a Maryland Avenue and there's an Eichelhart Avenue. So that's why it, it came from these slaveholders from Maryland who decided that they would come to Minnesota and invest in real estate. And Williamsburg Hall eventually became a judge and Harvard Eichelhart, he's one of the people who arranged for someone to hold his enslaved person for him in Maryland while he was living in Minnesota. He, he, he held a woman and the woman is held in his name in the 1860 census right by the names of I'm sorry, right by the enslaved people under the name of Harwood's father. So I think that Harwood's father kept Harwood's slave, but still in Harwood's name. Meanwhile, Harwood Iglehart is living in St. Paul while he's officially actively a slaveholder in Maryland. Wow. So I so if you live on so Iglehart is a street here in St. Paul. And that is named after a slave owner. That's right. Maryland Avenue. So when you're riding on Maryland, you might live on Maryland. Um, I've had, I, I stayed right off of Maryland before. If you live um, off of Maryland, that's talking about the state of Maryland. I believe was Harriet Tubman or there was slaves from Maryland. I won't say, she, but slavery was in Maryland. And there were slave owners from Maryland who invested heavily in the Payne Phelan area, and that's why Maryland Avenue is called Maryland today. That's right. And also, I'm just uh, going back over what you said because it's kind of uh, Ivy Avenue, Magnolia, Magnolia is are named after flowers from the South, and because of the, and they're named that because this is what these slave owners were named were naming. That's correct. Wow. Yep, that um, the one on Iglehart, that uh, that hit hard. Mm -hmm. uh, finding out, I, I, you know, had aunts and uncles and people who's who live on Iglehart. Slavery, even though slavery was considered illegal in Minnesota, Dred Scott was here, and people who were enriched off slavery were here were here also. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess the last thing I'll say is that we should always be conscious of a timeline of when things happen. So if we look at the starting point being 1619, at least for the British part of American colonization, you can even go back to 1565 with Spain being in Florida. But start at 1619 or 1565, and then the end point being 1865, that means that any time in between those two years was when slavery was existing. So in between those two years, you have Minnesota becoming a territory in 1849, Minnesota becoming a state in 1858. So when that happens at statehood, the end of slavery is still seven years away. And then in between the territory years and the statehood period, um, there's the Dred Scott decision. <clears throat> Let's see, in 1857, the Supreme Court said that any territory that somebody wanted to take a slave to, he could, or she could. And it didn't matter if it was in the North or the South. So that made every single territory a slave territory. There were no free territories anymore. And Minnesota was still a territory. It would be another 14 months, another year, before statehood. So from March of 1857 to May of 1858, slavery actually was legal in Minnesota. and Chattel book, slavery. Yes. And my book talks about quite a few people who took advantage of that 14-month window. 
Can and we go into that for a couple of minutes? I know you sure. got to go, but who sure. are who are some of the slate, and how did they take advantage of that? Well, Sylvanus Lowry's brother, uh, Tom Cal- brother-in-law, Tom Calhoun, was one of those people because Tom Calhoun. Okay. Yeah, Lowry had asked Calhoun to watch his house while Lowry went overseas to Europe. So Calhoun came to St. Cloud with his family, but also with a pregnant enslaved woman named Mary Butler in the summer of 1857. So by then, Dred Scott is the law and Minnesota still a territory. Mary gives birth in August of 1857 to a baby boy named John. And <clears throat> But since the law nationwide says that if a mother is a slave, the baby is a slave, that means John was born a slave in Minnesota. Now, when Minnesota becomes a free state, all of a sudden becomes illegal to have slaves in Minnesota. So Calhoun has a choice. He can either free Mary and John in Minnesota. He can free Mary and John somewhere else, or he can take them back to the South in slavery. And Calhoun decides to take Mary and John back to the South. Mm. And he took them back to Tennessee, which did not allow emancipation. So he probably sold Mary and John. But regardless of how he took them out, he came back to St. Cloud without them. So he probably sold them. Most likely. Right. And then came back to St. Cloud with that money. Yes. Dr. Christopher Lehman's book, Slavery's Reach, documents early white supremacist activity in the state of Minnesota. The origins of white supremacy and institutional racism in Minnesota is a Black Lives Matter Minnesota Film and Research Department production in partnership with Tran Cruz and the St. Paul Recovery Act Steering Committee. For more information, go to www.stpaulrecoveryact.com. Get involved, go to www.blacklivesmattersmn.com.